The following is distributed by the Berean Call. Chapter 11, Rebellion and Judgment Prophecies in the Bible refer often to the last days, the latter days, or the latter times. The first use of that phrase is found in Genesis 49, verse 1, where Jacob declares to his sons, Gather yourselves together, that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. In addition to foretelling what will happen at that time, Jacob's prophecy clearly declares that in the last days, Israel will still exist and be important in God's plans. A biblical teaching that many who call themselves Christians deny today. Nor can Israel and its importance as a nation, as already noted, in possession of the entire promised land ever cease. Repeatedly, the Bible declares that God gave the promised land to Israel by an everlasting covenant. God's integrity is tied to Israel, to her survival, ultimate restoration, and eternal blessing as He has promised in His Word through His prophets. Therefore, as we've seen, if Satan could destroy Israel and thereby prevent this full restoration and ultimate blessing, he would have proved God to be a liar, removing any moral basis for God to punish him for his lies to mankind, including the lies with which he deceived Eve in the Garden of Eden. That is what the Middle East conflict is all about. The Real Issue The satanic goal of Israel's destruction is the only rational explanation for worldwide anti-Semitism, including Islam's incredible yet foundational teaching that every Jew on earth must be annihilated before any Muslim can be resurrected. Obviously, Israel's survival and ultimate blessing under Messiah not only is essential to vindicate the God of Israel and the Bible, but to prove that Muhammad, Islam, and Allah are all frauds. Thus, the importance of what happens to Israel goes beyond the plans of the world's religious and political leaders. Their attitude toward Israel reflects their attitude and relationship to their creator and ultimate judge. The issues are eternal. Of the hundreds of prophecies about Israel, as we have already seen, many can be fulfilled only in the last days. For that reason, too, Israel cannot cease to exist, or many prophecies would be false. If even one prophecy were false, how could we trust anything else the Bible says? Incredibly, there are pastors and seminary professors who pick and choose what they believe of Scripture. In so doing, they are destroying the very foundation of the faith they hypocritically profess. What could be more foolish than for mere men to judge God? If the Bible is God's Word, it is all true. If not, then let's stop honoring it, the God who claims to have written it, and the Christ it tells us about. And let's honestly admit that Christianity is a dangerous delusion. The climax of all prophecy involves Jerusalem, and occurs in what is referred to as the Day of the Lord, also called that day. For example, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh. I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. The question, as previously noted, is often asked, Is the United States in Bible prophecy? Yes, all nations, and that must include the United States, will join together under Antichrist in one massive attack upon Israel and Jerusalem at the end of the Great Tribulation. Christ will intervene to rescue His people, destroying Antichrist armies and kingdom at Armageddon. God says, I will gather all nations. But isn't Satan the one who hates Israel and who will continue to attempt to destroy her to the very end? 
Doesn't he gather all nations against Israel under his false Messiah, the Antichrist? How can God and Satan be working together? They cannot. God uses Satan and his followers, but he does not inspire Satan to evil. That is Satan's nature. Nor does God even encourage, much less cause, anyone to seek to destroy Israel. He allows this hatred against Israel to be vented in order for the truth about the human heart to be revealed. He also allows it as part of His judgment upon Israel. That judgment is clearly spelled out in the prophecies given by Israel's own inspired prophets. It was Israel that gave us the Bible and the Messiah. The Bible's attention is focused on Israel from beginning to end. The current Middle East crisis is unfolding exactly as the Bible foretells. Based upon overwhelming evidence, one cannot avoid the conclusion that the grand finale of last day's prophecies is drawing very close, as we will see in the last chapter. Prophecy of History Recorded in Advance The entire history of the Jewish people and of the nation of Israel is foretold by the Hebrew prophets under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We have been able to look at only a small fraction of those amazing prophecies and the ongoing fulfillment in process of some of them today. When he brought the Israelites into their land, God warned that if they forsook him for pagan gods, he would scatter them to the ends of the earth. They would be hated, persecuted, and killed like no other people. He would not, however, forsake them completely. A remnant would be preserved. In the last days, he would bring them back into their own land again. At that time, God would make Jerusalem a cup of trembling to the neighbors surrounding her, and a crushing burden to the whole world. We have dealt briefly with these prophecies, which are clearly in the process of being fulfilled in our day. How astonishing that the people of God, in spite of all the miracles they had witnessed coming out of Egypt, would rebel against God turn to idolatry and immorality, these two always go together, and as a result, be cast out of their land in God's wrath. That fact, however, could not have been stated more plainly than in the many declarations concerning the future by Israel's own prophets. Such prophecies are given in specific detail and elaborated upon by many Hebrew prophets throughout the Bible. The following prophecies are not the pronouncements of anti-Semites, but of God Himself speaking through His chosen prophets. And no one pronounced God's judgment upon rebellious Israel more severely than Moses, who led them out of Egypt and to the borders of the Promised Land. As they were about to enter Canaan, God warned them once again through this great leader to whom he spoke face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend. Nor can it be denied that all of the following has occurred exactly as God foretold through Moses. But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. The Lord shall cause thee to be smitten before thine enemies. Thou shalt go out one way against them, and flee seven ways before them and shalt be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth. And thou shalt become an astonishment, a proverb, and a byword among all nations, whither the Lord shall lead thee. Moreover, all these curses shall come upon thee, and shall pursue thee and overtake thee, till thou be destroyed, because thou hearkenest not unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to keep his commandments and his statutes, which he commanded thee. 
and they shall be upon thee for a sign and for a wonder, and upon thy seed forever. If thou wilt not observe to do all the words of this law that are written in this book, that thou mayest fear this glorious and fearful name, the Lord thy God, ye shall be left few in number. And it shall come to pass that as the Lord rejoiced over you to do you good and to multiply you, so the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you and to bring you to naught. And ye shall be plucked from the land whither thou goest to possess it. And the Lord shall scatter thee among all people, from one end of the earth even unto the other. Among these nations shalt thou find no ease. The Lord shall give thee there a trembling heart, and failing of eyes, and sorrow of mind. And thy life shall hang in doubt before thee. And thou shalt fear day and night, and shalt have none assurance of thy life. In the morning thou shalt say, Would God it were even. And at even thou shalt say, Would God it were morning. For the fear of thine heart wherewith thou shalt fear, and for the sight of thine eyes which thou shalt see. Surely the millions of Jews who throughout history endured exactly what Moses foretold at the hands of the Roman Catholic Crusaders in Muslim lands for centuries, in the pogroms in Russia, in the hatred and persecution in Europe, and finally in the Holocaust, did not know their own scriptures, or they would have recognized the fulfillment and repented, crying out to God for mercy. And what of today? Do the Israelis understand their situation in light of what their prophets have said? Amazingly, millions of Christians claim not to see any connection between the Bible and modern Israel. Judgment Continuing to This Day The theme of judgment pursuing a scattered people was taken up by many other Hebrew prophets as God reiterated His warnings. The fulfillment of these judgments upon Israelis scattered everywhere is one more proof that they are the people of God to whom the promised land was given. No other people have experienced through history this continuing specific judgment. There are hundreds more such passages in Scripture. We can only cite short excerpts of a very few. If ye transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. I will cause them to be removed into all kingdoms of the earth. I will sift the house of Israel among all nations, like as corn is sifted in a sieve. Then shall they know that I am the Lord, when I have laid the land most desolate because of all their abominations." And the Lord hath sent unto you all his servants the prophets, rising early and sending them. But ye have not hearkened, nor inclined your ear to hear. They said, Turn ye again now every one from his evil way, and from the evil of your doings. Yet ye have not hearkened unto me, saith the Lord, that ye might provoke me to anger with the words of your hands to your own hurt. As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? In spite of the unbelief of most Jews around the world, there has always been a nucleus through the centuries who believed God's promises and who even recognized and admitted that the dispersion of Jews all over the world was God's judgment because of their sin. Moses ben Maimon, Maimonides, the famous Jewish physician and philosopher, whose family fled from Islamic persecution in Spain to, of all places, Fez, and who himself had to flee from Morocco later, wrote in his Epistle to Yemen in 1172, It is one of the fundamental articles of the faith of Israel that the future Redeemer of our people will gather our nation, assemble our exiles, redeem us from our degradation. 
on account of the vast number of our sins, God has hurled us in the midst of this people, the Arabs, who have persecuted us severely, as Scripture has forewarned us. Never did a nation molest, degrade, debase, and hate us as much as they. An Incredible Event Both God's blessings and judgments upon Israel throughout her history reveal His character. He is loving, kind, faithful, and true. But He will not leave rebellion unpunished, and He will not go back on His promises, whether for blessing or for judgment. Israel is a picture of all of mankind. Her history shows that God knows our weaknesses and is willing to pardon. But it also shows that, like Israel, we are all by nature stubborn rebels, proud, selfish, self-willed, determined to take our own way, and that God's love, mercy, and forgiveness must be tempered with His justice. From out of the fire of His presence that was blazing atop Mount Sinai, God thundered the Ten Commandments in a terrifying, majestic voice that all Israel audibly heard, yet, incredibly, did not obey. As they well might, the people trembled before this awesome display of God's presence and power. No fiction writer would have imagined, much less dared to write, the unbelievable rebellion that Scripture tells us occurred next. One of the many evidences that the Bible is the true Word of God lies in the fact that in giving us man's history from the Garden of Eden through the flood and onward, it spells out the evil in the heart, even of those whom God graciously blesses, and nowhere more clearly than at Mount Sinai. Astonishing though it seems, in spite of this audible and visible proof of exactly who the true God was, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Israel, who had delivered them miraculously from Egypt, they rebelled against Him. God had taken them through the Red Sea on dry ground, drowning the pursuing Egyptians behind them. He had led them with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, fed them daily with manna, and quenched their thirst with water miraculously flowing from a rock. Yet, while Moses was on Mount Sinai receiving the law from God, the people below broke the very commandments they had promised to keep. Having just heard them audibly spoken out of the fire and lightning, where Moses lingered above and had promised to keep. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down, they said unto Aaron, Make us gods which shall go before us. And all the people break off the golden earrings in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. And he made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And Aaron built an altar before it and made proclamation. Tomorrow is a feast day to the Lord. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go, get thee down, for thy people have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf, and have worshipped it, and have sacrificed thereunto, a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. And Moses besought the Lord his God, Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thine own self, and saidst unto them, All this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it for ever. And Moses turned and went down from the mount, and the two tables of the testimony were in his hand. The writing was the writing of God, graven upon the tables. 
God was testing Moses with the offer of having his descendants replace the twelve tribes of Israel. That was a great temptation, and Moses passed the test. He reminded God of his promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, promises that he must fulfill to maintain his integrity. If he failed to establish their descendants as a nation in the land he had promised to them, the other nations would say, with good reason, that he was not the true God. The same holds true today. The God of the Bible must fulfill his promises of ultimately restoring Israel as a nation in her own land once more, never to be scattered again. Or, he is a liar and not the true God and Creator. We well know the tragic story. When Moses returned to the camp of Israel and saw with his own eyes the idolatry and fornication that the people had fallen into at the very base of Sinai, he angrily smashed to the ground the tables of stone on which God had written His commandments. And why not? The people had already broken the law. What an incredible and yet instructive story revealing the human heart. God's Compassionate Love and Justice It was in the midst of this awesome scene that Moses begged of God, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. The mount was ablaze, the earth was quaking, and the people were being punished for this grievous, almost unbelievable sin. It was the perfect setting for God to thunder, I will show you what a harsh judge I am. Instead, he invited Moses to come once more up to the mount into his presence, where he would write the law on tables of stone again, the law that Israel had already broken. In response to the request of Moses, God replied, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. Up on the mount once again, the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty." God seems to add, will by no means clear the guilty, almost reluctantly. Repeatedly, the God of the Bible tells the Jews that He loves them. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto Himself, because the Lord loved you. The Apostle John, inspired of the Holy Spirit, declares, God is love. He cannot but love not only Israel, but all mankind, because love is not only His nature, but His very essence. Yet, God is also perfectly just. He cannot clear the guilty, for that would condone sin and corrupt His justice. The penalty He has pronounced must be paid. And... Wonder of wonders, God would Himself come as a man to pay that penalty in full, as He alone could, so that all who would believe could righteously be forgiven. Generation after generation, as they continued to rebel against Him, God sent His prophets to plead with His chosen people. Come now, and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the promised land. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. God did not want to punish His people, nor does He want to pour out His wrath upon this world. But he cannot condone evil. His pleadings with Israel came to an end at last, as they will with all mankind shortly. His holiness and righteousness required him finally to punish Israel. I sent unto you all my servants the prophets, rising early and sending them, saying, O do not this abominable thing that I hate. 
but they have hearkened not, nor inclined their ear to turn from their wickedness. Wherefore, my fury and mine anger was poured forth. Sadly, in spite of God's pleadings for His people to return to Him with their whole heart, Israel has persisted to this day in unbelief and rebellion against Him, and thus has missed the full blessing God graciously had promised to their forefathers. From the days of Moses to the present time, rebellious Israel has been under God's judgment. Nevertheless, Israel's full and final restoration, already in process, is assured never to be under His judgment again, but only by God's grace, not by her merits. Scripture makes that fact clear. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto Himself, above all people that are upon the face of the earth. Because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers. I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for mine holy name's sake, which ye have profaned among the heathen. Be ashamed and confounded for your own ways, O house of Israel. The Promise of the Messiah it was God's purpose to include from all eternity the entire world in His mercy toward Israel. At the very beginning, when God told Abraham, I will curse him that curseth thee, He also declared, In thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. That amazing guarantee was repeated again to Abraham, later to his son Isaac, then to Jacob. This promise, of course, could be fulfilled only through the Messiah, descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He would come to pay the full penalty for the sins of all mankind. All families of the earth could be forgiven and brought into unbroken fellowship with their Creator, if they were willing to accept salvation on His terms. The Messiah would not suddenly appear on earth out of thin air nor would he step out of a UFO and declare, Voila, here I am, the long-awaited Messiah. He required a genealogy of human ancestors in order to be a genuine man. He had to be God in order to be without sin and capable of paying the infinite penalty his own justice demanded for the sins of mankind. Yet, he had to be a genuine flesh-and-blood man in order to pay the penalty on behalf of mankind. God chose Abraham, and through him, Isaac, Jacob, and King David, and revealing his grace and forgiveness, even the harlot Rahab and Ruth the Moabitess, to be the ancestors of the Messiah. The Messiah had to be, and is, a Jew. Another reason why God has a special place in His heart for Israel. There is no escaping the prophecy of the great Hebrew prophet Isaiah. For unto us a child is born, the baby born in Bethlehem. Unto us a son is given, the eternal Son of God come as a man. And the government shall be upon His shoulder. So this promised one is the Messiah. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. So God is a father and has a son whom he gives to be the Messiah, and they are one. The Prince of Peace. This is the one who will bring everlasting peace. To be God's chosen people is a great honor, but it holds responsibilities as well as blessings that the Jews would be scattered all over the world, hated, persecuted, and killed, was more than prophecy. It was God's judgment upon them for rebellion and for the worst rebellion of all, rejecting their Messiah. Yet, through that rejection would come the crucifixion, and through that, the salvation of all who would believe. 
many centuries after God's promise of the Messiah to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the prophet Isaiah would not only foretell his coming as quoted above, but his rejection by his own people, and through that, the redemption of mankind. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him, and we esteemed him not. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. With his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief, making his soul an offering for sin. Restoration Promised In spite of their being under God's severe discipline for unbelief, and in spite of the prophesied fact that for centuries they would reject their Messiah, nevertheless, dozens of times in His Word, Yahweh has promised to preserve the Jews from total destruction. He would finally establish them back in their own land as an identifiable ethnic people, though in unbelief after which Messiah would return to rescue them at Armageddon and take the throne of his father David. God's integrity is tied to the ultimate restoration of Israel to her own land, never to be displaced again. But fear not, O my servant Jacob, and be not dismayed, O Israel, for behold, I will save thy seed from the land of their captivity." And Jacob shall return, and be in rest, and at ease, and none shall make him afraid. Fear thou not, O Jacob, I will make a full end of all the nations whither I have driven thee. But I will not make a full end of thee, but correct thee in measure. Yet will I not leave thee wholly unpunished." we have been able to refer to only a few of the many biblical prophecies concerning Israel. We have sufficiently documented, however, what is being fulfilled in our own day to show beyond doubt that everything that still remains for the future of what God has prophesied for Israel and for the world that opposes her will yet take place exactly as foretold. God's promise that He would finally gather all Jews from around the world to establish them as a nation back in their own land is undeniably now in process and will yet be completely fulfilled. Only since 1948, as He declared, has God begun to restore Israel, nearly 2,500 years after the Babylonian dispersion and then only partially and with continued fierce opposition from the Muslim nations surrounding her and from the entire world. There can be no question that the following prophecies have begun to be fulfilled and will be completed on schedule. I will gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. I will multiply them, and set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. Hear the word of the Lord, O ye nations, and declare it in the isles afar off, and say, He that scattered Israel will gather him, and keep him, as a shepherd doth his flock. For the Lord hath redeemed Jacob, and ransomed him from the hand of him that was stronger than he. Therefore they shall come and sing in the height of Zion, and shall flow together to the goodness of the Lord, for wheat and for wine and for oil, and for the young of the flock and of the herd. And their soul shall be as a watered garden, and they shall not sorrow any more at all. For I will turn their mourning into joy, and will comfort them, and make them rejoice from their sorrow." and my people shall be satisfied with my goodness, saith the Lord. As a shepherd seeketh out his flock, so will I seek out my sheep, and will deliver them out of all places where they have been scattered. And I will gather them from the countries, and will bring them to their own land. 
Behold, I will gather them out of all countries whither I have driven them in mine anger, and I will bring them again unto this place, and I will cause them to dwell safely, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them, that I will not turn away from them, that they shall not depart from me. So will I bring upon them all the good that I have promised them. And I will bring again the captivity of my people of Israel, and they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. And they shall no more be pulled out of their land, which I have given them, saith the Lord thy God. Opposition of Many Christians to Israel We have seen from the scriptures cited above, and there are literally hundreds more like them, that God has promised a full and final restoration of Israel, both physically in relation to her land and spiritually in relation to God himself. Of that final restoration, Paul declares, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through their fall salvation is come unto the Gentiles, for to provoke them to jealousy. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? Blindness in part has happened to Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, There shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. It is astonishing how many who claim to be Christians apparently have no fear of the God of the Bible. They are not afraid to flaunt their denigration of Israel in the face of the Creator of the universe, who 203 times calls himself the God of Israel, and has declared that these are his people by an everlasting covenant. Moses said, For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. He kept him as the apple of his eye. Clearly, this does not refer to Jews as individuals, but to Israel as a nation. Much less does it refer to the church as Israel's replacement. As already noted, but it bears repeating, twice more in Scripture is the nation of Israel affectionately referred to as the apple of God's eye. Yet most Calvinists and many of those who call themselves Reformed insist that Israel has been replaced by the church. For example, in 2002, the faculty of Calvinistic Knox Seminary in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, D. James Kennedy, founder, chancellor, president, and professor of evangelism, issued an open letter to evangelicals and other interested parties the people of God, the land of Israel, and the impartiality of the gospel. This statement, which denied that the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that is, the Jews, have any special blessings or place in prophecy, much less any claim upon the land of Israel, was initially signed by 71 prominent evangelical leaders, among them R.C. Sproul and Michael S. Horton. This document declares, in section 6, the inheritance promises that God gave to Abraham do not apply to any particular ethnic group, but to the church of Jesus Christ, the true Israel. Section 9. The entitlement of any one ethnic or religious group to territory in the Middle East called the Holy Land cannot be supported by Scripture. In fact, the land promises specific to Israel in the Old Testament were fulfilled under Joshua. Fulfilled under Joshua? Yet this refers to the church? Can they be serious? The church didn't even exist in Joshua's day. The error of that statement should be plain to any serious student of the Bible. We have seen that the land was given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and their physical descendants, by an everlasting covenant. 
certainly the everlasting possession of that land could not have been fulfilled under Joshua because he died at the age of 110, a far cry from everlasting. The land promises specific to Israel in the Old Testament included prophecies that Israel would be cast out of the land for unbelief, but brought back into it in the last days. Surely neither the casting out nor restoration were fulfilled under Joshua. Nor could the prophecies possibly have been fulfilled under Joshua that the Messiah would come to that land as a man to redeem Israel that Israel would reject and crucify him in that land, or that Israel, having returned to her land after being scattered worldwide, would be attacked by all the nations of the world in the battle of Armageddon, and that the Messiah would intervene to rescue her. Behold the power of prejudice against the Jews to blind even Christian leaders to the plain teaching of God's word that the vast majority of Jews today, including most rabbis, either ignore or deny these clear prophecies is no less astonishing. Israel must be fully restored. For Satan to be defeated, it is not enough for individual Jews to survive. Israel must exist as a nation in her own land. Thus saith the Lord, which giveth the sun for a light by day, and the ordinances of the moon and of the stars for a light by night, which divideth the sea when the waves thereof roar. If those ordinances depart from before me, then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. Many Jews worldwide reject the Bible and deny the existence of the God of Israel. Their Jewishness is purely cultural and traditional. As a consequence, they denounce what the world calls Zionism. Norman G. Finkelstein, already mentioned, is an example of this idea. He rejects the very existence of a nation called Israel whose proprietorship would be Jewish. Yet, he has no problem with the fact that the proprietorship of Germany is German of France is French, and so on. He cannot allow there to be a Jewish state that would serve as the homeland for a people who were repeatedly thrown out of their land by aggressors and persecuted and killed all over the world for centuries. He argues that the very existence of a historical homeland of the Jewish people would render the Jewish people alien to every other state territorial unit, thus sanctioning the claims of anti-Semitism. It's apparently acceptable that everyone else, from American Indians to Finns to Zulus, claims a historical homeland, but not for Jews. He even supports Arab imperialism that claims the entire Middle East for the great Arab nation, with no room in it for Israel to exist. He doesn't recognize that his anti-Israel position is inspired of another being in whom he doesn't believe, Satan. This same opposition to Israel is firmly held by many who call themselves Christians. It is astonishing how many true believers who are clear on most of the Bible remain adamantly opposed to what the Bible declares so plainly about Israel being restored fully to her land in the last days. It could rightly be said that one's attitude toward Israel, which is by far the major subject of the Bible, taking up at least 70% of its pages, defines whether or not one believes in God. Almost every event in the Bible happened either to or in Israel, as will prophesied events that are yet future. The church is not a nation, but is made up of people from every nation, and therefore could not have replaced Israel in prophecy. There is only one nation and one people, the Jews alone, to whom God ever gave a land, with specific perpetual promises concerning it. Certainly, the promised land was never given to the church, nor did she ever occupy it as a nation. 
The church was never, for her rebellion against God, cast out of a promised land, nor was the church ever promised a return to be established again as a nation in that land. But all of that and more was prophesied of and fulfilled in Israel. The church is clearly not Israel. It never was and never could be. Yet, 50 Bible scholars in the notes to the Renovara Spiritual Formation Bible declared that lie. A Clear Distinction God declares through Jeremiah, as quoted previously, that if a distinct nation known as Israel, which must be composed of the physical descendants of the Israel that was established in the Promised Land under Joshua, no longer exists, There is no sun in the sky, the stars have vanished, and the whole natural order is destroyed. Yet, there are not only Muslims and atheists, but also many Jews and professing Christians who say that today's Israel has neither prophetic significance nor divine legitimacy. They stand in direct opposition to God and to His Word. Indeed, they are denying the major prophetic proof God gives for His existence, and that the Bible is His Word. They must either repent or be punished for their opposition to what the prophets have foretold. Romans chapter 9 and 10 make as clear a distinction between the church and the physical people known as Jews constituting the nation of Israel as could be made. Paul is willing to go to hell eternally if that would bring about the salvation of his kinsmen according to the flesh who are Israelites, of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came. But one must be saved to be in the church. The church is composed only of saved people. Moreover, there are Germans, French, Spanish, Australian, Aborigines, Zulus, in fact, people from every tribe and nation on earth in the church. How could this variety of races all be called Israelites, the kinsmen according to the flesh of Paul and Christ? Impossible. He goes on to say that his heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Paul declared that Israel isn't saved. Then how could Israel be the church? This teaching turns the Bible inside out. Indeed, so perverse is this teaching that many who espouse it claim that Christ's promise to return has already been fulfilled, that he came back in A.D. 70 in the person of the Roman armies to destroy Jerusalem and to punish the Jews for rejecting him. Well, the dead were certainly not raised at that time, nor were the living caught up to meet Christ in the air and taken to heaven, as the Scripture declares. He is coming to rescue Israel, not to destroy her, and to rule the world from David's throne in Jerusalem. Even more astonishing, some of those who teach the Israel is now the church doctrine even claim that we are in the millennial reign of Christ. But the lion doesn't lie down with the lamb and eat straw like an ox, as Scripture foretells for the millennium. And it certainly could not be said that Satan is now locked up. In fact, he still goes about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Tragically, from the days of Moses to the present time, Israel as a nation has been under God's judgment, as her history proves, and will continue to be, though back in her land, until she repents and turns to the Lord. At the same time, however, she is under His protection, and woe to those who harm her. Jerusalem will continue to be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. In chapter 15, we shall see when that judgment from God will end in the final fulfillment of these last days prophecies. Please visit our website thebereancall.org to access our radio archives going back to 1999 and our newsletter going back to 1986. 
We offer daily updates by email or visit us on Facebook or Twitter. Are you looking for information about a specific topic? Go to the BereanCall.org and click on Topics at the top of the page. Our online store is TheBereanCall.com. We offer a wide variety of books, tracks, CDs, and DVDs. Note that most of our ebooks are free. I'm Gary Carmichael. Thanks for tuning in, and we hope you can join us again next week. Until then, we encourage you to search the scriptures 24 7. Though none go with me, I still will follow, no turning back, no turning back.